for Jack. I'll share them. Maybe I'll give one to every other person you guys can share. I was saying that the Um, I'm, we're here to talk about changes to operational practice uh, and how we collectively can support country transformations. And I think this means zooming out a little bit from the civil society and the local perspective we've been hearing about, but not forgetting it at all. Putting it in the context of broader, what do governments do, what do their development partners do, and how do we see this from um, multiple perspectives. I think we all know that there's a legacy of policy commitments over the last decades, including the new frameworks, um, the SDGs, the pathways to peace we've been discussing over the last few days. Um, we also have a collective recognition that often strategic policy commitments don't translate the way we intended into reality at the country level in the past. We hope very much these do. Um, but we thought it would be worth having a conversation um, bearing this implementation gap in mind and bearing in mind the fragmentation and the enormous implementation challenges we see in so many contexts. Um, two real questions. How in practice, operationally, are we collectively going to do things differently? And to the extent that we've committed to do things differently, we know what needs to be done. What are the constraints that are holding us back? Um, and that means, um, certainly from the development partner side, a time to reflect on our own practices. Um, at the institute where I, we work, we look normally at the country government practices, but we thought it was a time to step back and look more reflectively at what we do. Where are the constraints? Where are the incentives? And what would need to change at a really systems level um, to be able to make um, some of those changes? Um, so, um, the format for today, first we're going to ask for perspectives from Rwanda and from South Sudan, and then um, turn to look across different sectors. Um, the World Bank as a multilateral development partner, a representative from the foundation world, um, and a representative from um, the civic, civil society and the NGO world, so that we make sure that we look across those um, perspectives. Um, and we have today um, Bonnie from the, um, the commercial attaché from the Rwandan Embassy, um, Frank Busquet, who's the Senior Director for Conflict and Fragility at the World Bank, uh, Luca Pyongdeng, um, the Senior Leader and, and thoughtful re reflector on what's happened in South Sudan, but more generally in the field of peace building, Bridget Moy, um, who leads Peace Direct, and Rob Ricciolano from uh, Humanity United. Um, what we're going to do is have about 20 minutes of questions um, and then a discussion between the panels. So again, a little bit different in format from just the presentation and Q&A. Uh, and then open up to the audience. And I see in the audience many, many distinguished members and thoughtful leaders from this community. So we hope to have um, an interactive discussion. So feel free to ask your questions, uh, but also contribute your ideas. Um, so with that, a, a huge thank you and welcome. And um, so I'll start, Bonnie, with, with you. In your own country's experience, where have your international partners been effective partners to, to your goals? And what perhaps in retrospect, or as you look to the future, where are the changes that you'd like to see? Uh, thank you very much, Claire. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak uh, on behalf of my ambassador. I uh, wasn't able to be with you. Uh, she sends her apologies. But uh, for purposes of uh, this discussion, I think we'll, I'll first break it into four major points uh, uh, where Rwanda is. And uh, I'll start with the background of Rwanda's reconstru reconstruction. And then uh, what we've done, which is the coordination mechanism uh, between the development partners and what we are doing as a government. 
and a few key uh, accomplishments, and maybe later talk about uh, the perspective of Rwanda's development agenda, uh, which is the Vision 2050 today, uh, that is going to start right after the Vision 2020 that we are looking at that ends in the year 2020. So Rwanda, uh, with a small background of uh, the purposes of this discussion, is to, to, to look at uh, where we've been able to remember what happened to Rwanda. A million people died. Uh, in the 1994 genocide. Uh, uh, again, we are also surrounded by three million refugees uh, from the neighboring countries, and, uh, and already staggering or uh, inconsistent uh, economy that shrunk almost up to 50% in 1994, and the GDP per capita that fell to almost uh, $146, uh, a level that took us way back, uh, like 20 years, uh, say 1990, 1975. Uh, we also saw inflation going up to 64% and poverty rate going up to 78%. So what were the aspirations of the Vision 2020? Today we are in 2018, but that time uh, what we were looking at was uh, developing a consultative process that helped us to have some aspirations of becoming a middle-income country uh, by the year 2020 that had pillars like uh, good governance and uh, having a stable state, uh, human resource development, and having a knowledge-based economy, a uh, private sector-led economy, uh, infrastructure development, but also having some cross-cutting areas like gender equality, protection of the environment, and the science and technology, uh, including ICT. So what we managed to do as a country uh, in terms of uh, the coordination mechanism uh, we looked at all these expectations that we have in our vision 2020, but what did we do to include our development partners to be part of the game? Uh, it's because we had a plan in place. Uh, if I give an example of uh, our poverty reduction strategy paper that looked at 2002 to 2006, uh, we looked at our, our post-recovery period uh, that was focused on, energy, on, on, on the health sector and education, and also looking at how we could reduce the poverty levels. And then in the 2008 to 2012, it looked at preparing us to a takeoff stage where we we're reconstructing uh, uh, again our economy and looking at high growth levels that were going up to 8%. Um, so how did we do it? We developed an enabling environment for a donor coordination uh, system where we had good governance that was put on at the front of everything. Uh, having an accountable uh, level, it's not only us as a government, but also looking at what the development partners were committing themselves to do, uh, having reforms in our public finance uh, management. So we developed what we call uh, a development partners coordination, uh, which was an aid policy uh, that was out in 2006, and that is what we are looking at. And this was based on the context of the Paris uh, Declaration on Aid Effectiveness, uh, tailored to the Rwanda uh, needs. Uh, so. Looking at only what we've done, the key highlights were the ownership and the alignment of what the government expects and also what we expect from the donor partners, but also having things like mutual accountability where we, we had development uh, partners assessment framework uh, that is working annually and also looking at ourselves on the side of the government with our performance contracts that at all levels uh, of our administration. I think with that, uh, I'll start, I'll just stop there for now. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thanks, uh, Claire. I think it is good that you brought these two examples of Rwanda and South Sudan, extreme. They were very successful, the second one, a lot is desired. The way I would like to ask to answer this question is, it is true the situation South Sudan is in now is a, a reflection of a failure of the leadership of both international partners as well as people of South Sudan. But importantly, it is a country that received a hell of assistance and goodwill at the, uh, after the signing of the peace agreement. So I think we have a shared responsibility. But in the middle of this despair, I think we should look also for the uh, window of opportunities. And that's the importance of this, this meeting. What, what, what went well? I think this is the most important thing. I think when we talk about the issue of, of partnership and aid effectiveness, we look to this 
six commitments. Alignment, coordination, harmonization, predictability, and mutual accountability and institutional development. Me, I was so engaged in the government with the World Bank, we formed the first multi-donor trust fund. So I'm talking about what I saw and, and what I experienced in the, uh, in the system. And I know that a lot of evaluation being done to assess. And it seemed as if always we painted a very bleak picture about South Sudan. But based on these six commitments and principles, I would say coordination worked extremely well in Southern Sudan, especially after the signing of the, the peace agreement in 2005. How, what happened? I said, why did it uh, succeed, especially the coordination? First, there was this joint assessment mission. Uh, some of us were engaged in this assessment mission. And it is one of, in a situation whereby the national government may not have the capacity to articulate its vision, it is very important the partners to engage with the, uh, with the government or, or the post-conflict uh, government. And that's what actually painted, I mean, charted out a very clear priorities collectively. The second one, as in, in, um, in the situation of, of, of Rwanda, aid strategy immediately. We developed aid strategy that in a very inclusive process involving the, 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 the donors as well as the partners. And this, and this document, this strategy was actually approved by the executive and even endorsed by the parliament. So at least to ensure national ownership and then the, uh, the political leadership in supporting this strategy. And what, and I, I think, and it's, it's, and was informed by the whole lot of uh, the, uh, the Paris declaration and the year. The third one was the budgeting process. Aid was linked to the budgeting process, uh, which I think it helped a lot the planning cycle of the budget, the donors and partners were engaged in setting the priorities and the allocation of resources. And, um, uh, and, and, and the, the, the last one is the coordination forum. We established a very, a very annual quarterly uh, forum for the coordination with the donors. And lastly, and including the first time for the South Sudan to have what is, to, what is called coordination uh, office of the donors, except with a few, at least they were actually, you know, coordination is not between the government and the, but among the donors. And, and, and I think that one is a very positive one. And then the political commitment. The very fact the government of Southern Sudan allocated for each dollar donated by external partners, they match it with two dollars. And that actually helped in the terms of the coordination. But for the rest of the commitment did not succeed. Uh, let, let me give you some of the, some of the area where, where they did not succeed. Alignment of aid to the, uh, to the government priorities. In the joint assessment and the government priority, government put a very clear security is the top. But when we came to the actual allocation of resources, most of the donors, they shy away from the security. And what happened, you, they gave the chance to the government to allocate all the resources to the security sector, which actually was dominated by two ethnic groups. And in actual fact, we're accentuating the, the, the drivers of conflict in South Sudan. And, and, I, and I, what could have been done differently? We know because of the capacity of the government was so weak. But always, there's no way you can avoid government. You look for niches, opportunities, especially the local government. These are the institutions they sustain over time. The moment you start at the top and you forget the lower level, this lower level, they are resilient, and you need, you would have been good if they could have started with that one. Prioritize security. I think shying away from security is a big challenge to, for the, do, the development partners, and especially for the donors. It's a territory that I think no go zone for a few people, even not to engage in. And then the core conflict issue. Sometimes we assume that peace agreement will be sustainable, and the development will bring peace. Sometimes that peace, that development itself, a bad peace can become a driver for insecurity. Mm -hmm. And I think it is very important to have, although sometimes we have this, what is called conflict analysis, it is one and off, it is important to have an, uh, the conflict analysis to be periodic so that you can be able to map the changes. What happens is that we assume this peace and then we'll be able to. And then in institutional development, I think the whole lot of heavy load at the top and not to focus at the, at the local level I think we need to rethink 
whether we can top the sun from bottom up rather than top down. Thanks. Thank you, Victor. Um, now we might turn to World Bank is, is laying a comprehensive reform foundation for different practices. So you know, what's already been done and where do you see the frontier of where the World Bank and its development partners can and should go in the, in the years ahead? Thank you, Claire, and uh, many thanks for inviting us. Uh, I'm mean, very happy to be here, especially looking at the title, you know, peace building and development. I think one of the key messages I have, I will try... I will speak louder because that's so important. One of the key messages I have <laughs> is precisely to ensure that we are working with other actors. And I'm going to, I mean, I have, a, I have a speech, but let me go off script. The first point is that we are really at the bank recognizing more and more the importance of working in uh, with security, but also with humanitarian and with peace building actors. Doesn't mean that the bank will need to change the mandate, not at all. It means that it's part of an integrated approach. And I think what we just learned in South Sudan is very revealing about the fact that we are moving more and more towards an integrated approach. I think that's the first signal. And if you look at the UN uh, World Bank Pathway for Peace, by the way, the first time the UN and the World Bank put together a report, which is also revealing in itself, it really shows two messages. First, focus on prevention. It's fine to respond to crisis, but it's even better to try to avoid crisis. Is there a role for development actors? Big time. It's not only a question of peace security, it's a question of trying to position uh, the development actors addressing the grievances so that those grievances do not lead to escalation of violence and conflicts. And we know that $1 invested in prevention can save $16 in uh, reconstruction. So I think that's the first key message. The second one is precisely what was raised very nicely uh, in the case of South Sudan. You cannot just look at the development uh, agenda by itself. When we work today in Central Africa Republic, we are working very closely with security actors, working very closely with uh, MONUSCA that are basically letting us know when there is a space for development. Central Africa Republic, as you know, government has control about 20, 30% of the territory. And here, what are we trying to do? We are trying to support the government, reestablishing its legitimacy, having inclusive institutions in basically 60% of the territory where it does not have control. So the link between security peacekeepers and development is extremely important. So we are trying to be more agile. It's work in progress. Basically here it means that being able to uh, design and implement in a more agile manner programs that can immediately support the state in terms of reestablishing credibility and legitimacy vis-a-vis -vis citizens in area where before there was no development and that's why also citizens were tempted by other forms of, of states. So I think this is extremely important. And my last point um, that I would like to mention is that we are really trying as well to work in full partnership with also humanitarian actors, not only peacekeepers, not only security, but we realize that more and more crises are protracted crises, and therefore the whole point about working with UN agencies, we're working with other partners, NGO, ICRC, is actually critical. You have the foot on the ground, you have the intelligence that we don't necessarily have, and you have the competency that the bank does not have. What does that mean concretely? It means that we are scaling up our resource. Over the next three years, we are going to double our resource in fragile states, going from seven to 14 billion dollars. But the whole point is not about financing, because even 14 billion dollars is not much compared to the needs, because we really need to focus on the uh, whole coordinated approach. What is different today is that we are looking at responding to the drivers of fragility. So any country partnership framework supporting government is actually addressing grievances and drivers of fragility. So it's not a question about pouring money, supporting, strengthening national institution. It's not only a question of capacity or governance. It's actually helping at the local level addressing some of the key areas that needs to be tackled. And it means taking more risk. It means adding more than 150 staff on the ground and not talking from Washington. And it means as well trying to work in the Kivu or in Bambari and not in Kinshasa and, and Bangui. So I think that's just my key message. It's not about financing, but it's about being humble, realizing that there is a lot of failures in the past that we need to look at it carefully. We need to kill silos and actually work with all the partners and trying to see how we can be more impactful in the most insecure settings. And, and before I turn to the next question, maybe just a follow-up question. If, if you're able to reflect on some of the constraints um, and institutional changes that perhaps you're already undertaking <coughs> to make this change practice happen. Sure. And you've already mentioned something, having more people in the field is, is 
certainly one of yeah. those. I think it's, as I mentioned, it's working progress in our area. So basically it means for us to be actually more agile, being, being able to focus more on implementation of projects. When you prepare projects going to the board in uh, this type of environment, in a fragile environment, guess what? You know for sure that the condition of the country will be different by the time that the project closes. So what does it mean in terms of being more agile and being able to be more responding the way that NGO are responding to situation? Second point, it's not by having staff in Washington DC, it's having, having staff on the ground. Over the past year and a half, we already had more 90 staff that are in fragile states. We, are going to, we have committed to add more than 150 staff. But more importantly, we are looking for changing more the DNA of the institution. So basically it's to ensure that when staff are on the ground, we are looking at their career development. We see FCV, fragility, conflict, and violence as a top priorities, because at the end of the day, we know that for our twin goal, which consists also to eradicate poverty, if you don't su succeed in fragile states, you will fail. 50% of extreme poor will be in fragile states by 2030, and therefore making sure that we can not only prioritize in our investment, in our financing, but also in terms of career development for staff so that they see working in fragile state as a top priority. So there is a number of measures, including on human resource, trying to make sure that um, uh, the experience on the ground is uh, being tagged. Right? So in terms of promotions, career development, this is going to be counted. We are looking at the policies to be more agile. We are looking at the human resource, but also, as I said, which is very important, more about what are we doing with the funding. The whole key point is to look strategically at the grievances. That's the whole point about the report UN World Bank Pathway for Peace. Let's make sure that we are just, just providing additional financing, but that we are looking at what are the key drivers of fragility, whether it's about natural resource, whether it's about climate change, when you look at East Asia, I was in Papua New Guinea recently and other countries, whether it's about addressing the issue about youth, uh, fertility in Africa, looking as well about the whole issue of lagging regions, how can we ensure that our programs are not just adding funding, but that are really addressing some key drivers of fragility? And that's very complex, it's easy to say, but at least the focus is in this regard. And the last but not least is partnering, as we mentioned. All that is, of course, work in progress. We're trying more and more to partner. I have to say that the partnership with the UN in fragile states is probably at the level which has never been. Uh, if I take some example with UNHCR, uh, our team are actually doing joint mission with UNHCR. Uh, we are providing funding to countries that are fragile states, hosting refugees, because 90% of refugees, by the way, are in developing countries, and we are doing that jointly with UNHCR, which provides the assessment of the refugee policy framework. Now, is it is something different for the bank? Yes. This is actually something that the bank was not investing at all before, thinking about this is a humanitarian crisis, we will come during reconstruction or after the crisis. Well, that's not relevant in most of the case because crisis are lasting 20, 25 years. Mm -hmm. So the whole point is what can we learn and how can we immediately focus on development with other actors, including during conflict. We are working in Iraq, we are working in Yemen, putting one $1 billion of investment with no staff on the ground, working with UN agencies, because it's not only a humanitarian crisis, this is a development crisis. So I could go long and long, but uh, as you may have guessed, it's not about funding, it's about doing things differently in a more humble manner and trying to partner with key actors that are bringing knowledge and experience that we don't necessarily have. And that's why the whole point about your meeting today, this conference, is excellent. Not partnering with security, peacekeepers, or humanitarian actors uh, will lead to the lack of efficiency of the aid money. So it's actually extremely important. Thank you. Um, Bridget, and I will say, um, you were, as you may, all of the panelists were invited not only because they represent their countries or their institutions, but they've been long sought leaders in, in these different areas. And Bridget, you've long um, spoken about the importance of working locally and directly, but I know you're also leading some new thinking into what you and your um, sector, your field, can, can be doing differently. O over to you. Yeah, thank you so much. This is a um, really helpful conversation. Um, so Peace Direct, for those of you who don't know Peace Direct, uh, it was founded about 15 years ago in the UK, and really on the fundamental belief that in any situation of violent conflict, there are always people building peace. Um, often local people who are at the, the center, the core of the violence and the impacts, um, and are, are finding creative ways to respond to those realities. But remarkably, the institutions and the structures and the systems we have tend to marginalize rather than put those people at the center. So I was reflecting on the title of this panel that instead of the frontier, 
I want to bring us back to the center of, of peace building. Um, so Peace Direct uh, has worked now for 15 years trying to figure out how do we do this well? How do we partner better with local peace builders um, in countries of conflict who are doing remarkable work so that they can grow their work and um, increase their impact? And um, we've done it in a number of ways, and as you mentioned, we're also learning and evolving um, some of the ways um, that we're trying to engage with partners and also with the um, peace building international community as well. So um, we have strategic partnerships where we develop very long-term relationships with specific local groups who do really good work. And those relationships are certainly about finding funding and resources for them, but that is not the core part of the relationship. The relationship is a partnership where we engage in how do we help reduce violence in your community? What are all the ways that we can support you? Not just how do we get money out, you know, one funding stream into uh, another pot. Um, so we develop strategic partnerships and we really try to make those learning partnerships um, and, and develop the program work um, uh, over time. We also um, work to support networking um, among local peace building groups. So for instance, through what we call peace exchanges, um, we try to create a space where local groups can come together and do their own analysis, deepen their analysis about the situations that they face, and then um, talk about what are the right strategies for peace building. And then, okay, so how then can we help support those strategies? So that um, factor of networking is really important for local actors because they're often not able to connect uh, with one one another um, for various reasons that we can also talk about. Um, and then we've also um, done more and more work um, to try to connect local civil society peace building actors with actors in government, actors in multilateral institutions, so that we're trying to bridge um, those levels. Uh, we bring local peace builders here to Washington and to New York at the UN. There's a group here, some of them are here and they'll be um, on stage later. Um, and we try to give them opportunities to speak directly to decision makers and policy makers. Um, we have partners who've um, done that in their own countries. Um, Michael in the back has um, really built wonderful relationships and connections with the government in Nigeria. Um, so that we're trying to create um, more binds and ties across those levels. Um, and then finally, we really try to do um, research and profile raising, not just with our own partners, but with local peace builders around the world. So we have a website called Peace Insight. We profile over 1,600 local peace building groups around the world on that. And that is really, it was, the, the idea behind it was to say, you know, one of the myths in aid and development is they'll see a conflict country, South Sudan, and they say, oh, there's no local capacity. There's just no local capacity. There's always local capacity. And so we wanted to say, here, let's put it up on a website so everyone can see and hopefully then also help generate more um, support and understanding. So that's been the way that we've been working. Um, one of the things that we've been evolving um, now, and we're, um, I think this is not new or, or particular to us, but is we've really started to focus in on that um, networks, uh, and Rob will talk much more eloquently than I do about this, but recognizing that partner, individual partnerships, individual funding um, relationships are really important. They help partners do good work that's vital um, in their communities, but they, we also need to create more systems. Um, so we talk about going from a points of light approach, where we were supporting a lot of different um, part, individual partners, points of light in the midst of conflict, to a constellations approach. How do we support um, those points of light to link up better um, to grow uh, the networks that they're reaching um, and to shine brighter. So we're doing more work in um, a couple places. Mali is one, DRC is another, where we're really trying to um, do more of that type of constellation network uh, supporting as well. So I'll stop there and look forward to more conversation. Thank you. And Rob, um, where is the peace building and development world now? What are the constraints for moving forward and where should we go? Um, I want to start just first with a slight organizational affiliation revision. So um, Humanity United is part of the Midyar group, which is a family of, of foundations. Um, and, and since I think there are no other H, um, a Midyar group affiliated organizations here, I can say that Humanity United is, of course, the best of all the uh, Midyar group organizations. That's being uh, supported. Um, <laughs> we can blank that out. Um, so and I work for a team that works across the group and, and largely to help uh, the teams, um, including the ones at Humanity United, um, incorporate systems and complexity thinking into the kind of work that they do. Um, and so um, 
there's certainly several things that, that we've seen. We, we've actually done, I mean, so I'm, I'm pointing to Elise over here as my colleague from Humanity United. Um, so Elise's team has done some really interesting analysis, a systems, a dynamic systems analysis of um, the peace building as a sector. Um, and what are the dynamics that hold us back and maybe are the things that can propel us or the capacities that actually could propel reform and change. And, and so there certainly are those things. We've done some other ones within um, the Midyar group on roughly the same topic. And, and so I, I think there's, the, I wanted to sort of talk about philanthropy as like what can we be doing differently. Um, and, and one of them picks up on this notion of seeing from an attitudinal perspective of seeing yourself and seeing the issues you're dealing with, not just as specific discrete issues or dis specific discrete inter grants or interventions, but as part of a, of a complex whole. And so you always have to be reflecting on how what you're doing is affecting not just the immediate thing you're touching, but the bigger whole, the ecosystem that you're working in, the constellation that you're working in, but also how that constellation is affecting what you're trying to do, right? So you, you gotta see yourself part of the system and what's the interrelationship between you. And then I think, Frank, the, the humility, I would say, is the other, other one. It's not that um, uh, people like Elise or anybody else is arrogant. It's that as donors, I think, as a, as a sector, we have this inflated sense of what we can do. And I, so maybe it's something about people that have access to large amounts of money have a more of a challenge in that regard, but it, it's to see that you, you don't make change. Um, and in some ways, having money and having the power that goes with that money is actually a, 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 a challenge, a barrier that you have to actually deal with uh, proactively. So I, that element of humility about what is, what is our role in making change and how does change happen, I think is a really important attitudinal um, adjustment. I think there's been lots of structural changes in how we work um, <coughs> across the group. Um, so a lot more participatory processes. So there, there was this sort of feeling that as a, as a donor, you had to have the rest of the world out there, and then you sort of did your expert analysis and you decided what button to push somewhere. Um, but in fact, the, one of the biggest impacts you can have is through the processes by which you work and how you work and, and how you bring people in. Um, it's more than just, it's the connections amongst people, but it's also the sort of social capital that you begin building and the attitudinal change that begin to begin to happen. Um, and also this idea of platforms for change. So, so they take various forms, but basically what we're doing is a lot of our, our programs are really trying to activate a local platform for change, that it's bringing people together, like you were saying, Bridget, and, and helping them find the, what, are the, what are the ways forward? What do we need? How do we do it? Um, and then I think there's a, there's a bunch of, of sort of practices of behavioral changes around um, regular and systematized kind of learning processes. Um, I know everyone, wants to, everyone likes to say now, oh, you know, failure is good, and um, but we all kind of have a neurological addiction to success, right? So it's, it's hard to actualize that, but you only do that if, you're, if you are learning on a constant basis and you make it a practice, you make it a muscle that, that, you, that you're exercising regularly. Um, different ways to assess impact. So I was having a conversation this morning uh, with folks who want to know about how are you assessing impact of peace building, and we were talking about this from a sort of systems perspective, and I said the hard part is, is you actually want to say, I need to, I first I need to sort of work on your paradigm of what success is, because that's going to change how you measure it, um, and what you think success is, and how it's achieved. So there, there are ways different, and I think uh, more, uh, ways of assessing impact that actually um, allow us to be more systemic. So instead of the top down we want predetermined metrics, which take the hand, the power out of the hands of the people on the ground, and put it into the into the implementers and into the donors. Um, we have to we have to flip. We have to have ways of measuring impact that that avoid that that danger. And then I, I think um, um, lastly, I just want to say one of the hardest things that I've seen across all the different teams that I work with is changing how we disperse money, um, because how we disperse money tends to be very business as usual. Um, it, it's, it's driven by um, predetermined outcomes, and there's a fear of not hitting those outcomes, because money could be, quote unquote, wasted. And whereas people under, under, um, undervalue the risk of being way too determined and, and siloed in how you give money, that's the bigger risk than someone might misspend the money on the ground. Um, so it, it, how, do, how do we actually disperse money, and, and I think that relates to how we think of risk, um, of what is risk. I think we, we, we tend to minimize short-term risk of meeting a preset objective, and we maximize the risk 
of having unsustainable outcomes or disempowering the very actors we're trying to empower. I was thinking of the, of the, the commitments, the six commitments and the frameworks idea. And this came up, I think, yesterday, is that uh, frameworks are great and that they can pull together, keep our eyes on the prize, like what's really important. They can be destructive as we begin to think that they're not holistic. We begin to think that it's a bunch, it's six different things. Like I was thinking of how you were talking about some commitments were made and kept and others not. And people sort of forget that you can't easily pull them apart. Um, and so that's a, that this, for me, this, I, going back to sort of seeing the system, right? It's how, seeing how we do as a, as a, as a part of a whole. Um, so I'll start there. Okay, thank you. We're going to take a few more questions, have a discussion here, and then open it up in a few minutes. Um, so if any of you want to respond to anything you said as I come through, please start with that. But I've also got questions for you all. But I thought I might start building on your point about the need for the attitudinal shift and working together in different ways. And I think from uh, Mr. Mr. Fano, what, what you said, this um, it seems that this what your government, um, your country managed to institute was a shift to a performance culture um, and a real innovation, which the Googles and the Microsofts of the world are busy implementing, was done through this Imhigo system, both holding um, the country at multiple levels, using a traditional system accountable, uh, but also grading your donors, which um, is often talked about but rarely done. Um, but I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about the changes that you saw in the, sort of in the culture of institutions as that process moved forward. But also feel free to respond to what you've heard. That's right. uh, thank you very much again. Um, probably if I, I speak to some details about the coordination mechanism that we use, uh, usually every year we have what we call uh, the annual partners retreat where we invite all our donor partners plus the government, uh, the Ministry of Finance and the different sectors uh, have their permanent secretaries who handle the finance part of it to come in and have their own presentations. So all these are based on what uh, I mentioned earlier on our side as a government uh, that we call in Mihigo. Uh, these performance contracts are based on what you need to achieve uh, as a ministry. Uh, if I use an example of the Ministry of Health, uh, what do you have to do in four or five years? And how do you break it down into one year? How do you break it down into the Kotali system? So during uh, such a retreat is when they talk about it. Uh, but we also have what we call the Development Partners Coordination Group uh, that oversees the overall coordination of uh, the whole National Strategy Transformation Coordination Team. And the third one is a joint sector review uh, that has both backward and forward uh, uh, looking that has that happens twice as well uh, in terms of assessment. So all this is a coordination that brings both uh, the government as a recipient but also the donors uh, to be accountable. And again, it brings me to what we, we, we might define as a division of labor uh, and also look at why exactly, what exactly are we focusing on? We're, we're looking at how do we reduce the transaction costs? How do we reduce the duplication of what the government is doing? Uh, to be streamlined with what uh, the development partners coordination expects. So one of the criteria that we, we look at is uh, the financial or the budget, the budget gaps in the priority sector areas, but also the ability of the donors to provide uh, government, the government uh, preferred aid modalities or the type of uh, given sector that one might decide. So all this is based on the historical track records that we have. So we, we, we look at the mandate of the donor as well, uh, based on what we also expect that should be coming out of our, our leadership. And all this is a uh, top-bottom or bottom-up approach. So uh, it's all around the, the level of accountability that uh, looks at the whole structure. Thank you. Um, Frank, maybe an invitation to respond to what you've heard, but maybe also to illustrate what you've, because you've laid out a very comprehensive agenda, including a frank assessment of the challenges, but maybe some one or two examples of where you've seen, you mentioned CA already, but where mm -hmm. are you seeing around the world these change practices perhaps beginning to take shape? Sure, and first I would like to recognize the example of Rwanda. I think it's important also to learn from success. We always focus you know, on a negative, and when you deal with fragility, conflict, and violence, you have a number of examples. I think it's also good to learn how countries have actually uh, addressed those issues. I mean, what I'm hearing here about the country leadership is essential. The need to focus on performance, on results, on strengthening systems, 
the whole point about aid coordination, but also recognizing that not everybody can finance the same activities. You know, coordination doesn't mean we do everything together, no. It means that you look at the comparative advantage of humanitarian, security, or development actors. I mean, this requires real leadership. And I think this is actually extremely important. Um, so now in terms of example, I think of partnership with uh, humanitarian actors, security or peacekeepers, I think I could mention also the way we are working in Mali. Uh, we are working in the center uh, of, the, of the country because there is still some space for development and we believe uh, that it's essential for development actors to provide hopes, jobs, services for citizens so that they are not being tempted by another form of state. Uh, that requires partnership not partnership on the paper, but actually working at the rehabilitation of the port of Kona, as we are doing today in Mali, talking with security actors, talking with uh, the MONUSMA. Uh, I could mention as well the way that we are looking now in Kivu, in DRC, looking at also with MONUSCO, what type of partnership will allow us to make an inference in this area, which obviously needs to be addressed in terms of grievances, and that's why you see the link between conflict and development. So it's not about just adding money financing in Kinshasa, this is also looking at those most insecure and fragile settings. Uh, so I think, you know, we can go uh, beyond, I was talking about Yemen, where, I mean, in terms of partnership, what a partnership. We even don't have a presence on the ground, and we are working with WHO, UNICEF, UNOPS, WFP, because we believe today that we need, in addition to the humanitarian aid, we need to provide support to strengthen the resilience of the institution, not to lose generation, because we know that the, uh, the conflict will last, uh, and we know that it's unfortunately going to not to be stopping tomorrow, and you have need for health, needs for education, and you have some institutions at the local level, by the way, that needs to be strengthened, uh, and that's not humanitarian, it's also development. So your whole point about working in the toughest place, having staff in those areas, working with partners during conflict, this is something new for the bank. Is it about financing? No, this is actually about doing things differently. And I think I fully agree and subscribe with the points that were being made. Of course, financing help. And when you look at the needs, I mean, 80% of humanitarian needs are driven by conflict. If you look at the cost of conflict, it's $14 trillion in 2016. If you look so clearly, financing is important. We are here for the long term. We are here to strengthen the system. And when you look at the needs in these countries, it, it, that, that's extremely important. But it's not about financing. It's also about doing things differently and going sometimes in the out of comfort zone, working with different partners and addressing grievances at the local level. I really like the point mentioned about people-centric approach. Because at the end of the day, this is really the focus that is extremely important. Uh, so I will stop here. Thank you. Luca, any reaction to your colleagues? Where would you push this, oh. uh, this field to go even further? And okay. perhaps, if, you know, also if you look at South Sudan, I'd invite you to share if you wish, are there, where are there points of hope or light or a pathway yeah. forward to peace for South Sudan? Yeah, um, maybe let me start what is the difference between Rwanda and South Sudan. I think the same, <laughs> same Africans there. But the, the difference is definitely in the leadership. I think we need to emphasize the, the importance of leadership. Southern Sudan would have avoided all these things if we were having a right leadership. But I don't want also to overemphasize the issue of leadership because the problem with the danger of a leadership in personalities rather than institutional leadership. And that's the problem because we may be seeing some success now but these success, if they are not anchored to the institution, then we have a problem. And I, I think this is what I, I want to highlight with why the difference between. The other one that I want to highlight also in the case of South Sudan is the post-conflict situation. In most cases, you have these uh, uh, power sharing arrangement, which actually rewarding the elites, but even what I call the gun class. In most cases, the state itself is immediately captured by this gun class because they are rewarding those with guns. And there's a very, a link between those in power, the political uh, parties, the security sector, the, the link is very blurred. And so are that so interconnected. And they created a, a what, what I say, the cycle of fragility by risk, because the gun class they are very, have, an, exclusive entitlement, not to power, but even to the resources of the state. And I think in the such a post-conflict situation, you may need to see those dynamics of these actors, and that to be, to be aware of. The uh, one thing I just want to highlight also is this issue of non-state actors. 
So it has been shown many state actors may not be effective in bridging between the citizens and the aid. And that is why there's a need to focus on the state itself at different levels. If the state at the top is not functioning, you can start recognizing the state at the local level and, and build on that one because by the end of the day, it is their core function to deliver. And if we shy away, then we have a problem. And I agree with you, the, the issue of shy away means the risk itself and because commit, making a mistake in dealing with this a corrupt, a weak institution, you shy not to deal with them, you are actually avoiding a problem that you have to solve it now. Yeah. And, and that's the issue of risk. Uh, the way we look at risk is a very, is a very, a very important. Um, so I think, and, and the, the most important point is the issue of social capital. It has been shown, and in the case of South Sudan, you may have a very good in institutions. But if there is no trust and social cohesion, in fact, it is very important to know that the social cohesion can shield the institution themselves, become a prerequisite even before you talk about the institution. So the trust and social cohesion is absolutely very important. So let me stop here. So many things I want to say. Well, I, I just would want to um, maybe pick up on the theme of mutual accountability, which was raised by a number of people, and I think you're pointing to as well. Um, I think this issue of mutual accountability, um, and we could think of lots of different actors that it would involve, is really fundamental for changing the system. Um, we have a we, our favorite activity when we get together with all our partners from around the world, we do this a couple times a year. We did it in Beirut earlier this uh, year. And we have an exercise where we let all the partners go off in their corner and all the Peace Direct um, staff go off in our corner. And then we talk about our partnership. What's working, what's not working. And it's like all your grievances about it. Get it out there. And then we come back together and we share and we talk about them. And then we make some plans. Okay, how can we improve? And it's a really simple exercise. It is not anything, you know, that takes a lot of sort of um, high intellectual figuring of out how to do. It's just a simple exercise of mutual accountability. But it's, it makes us, it, even when we don't get it all right, it makes us feel like, okay, this is a partnership. We can, we can um, air this. So I think that figuring out what are the simple ways that we can create more mutual accountability, you know, mechanisms that are um, allowing citizens to speak to governments, that are allowing donors um, to be graded. Uh, I think these are all the kinds of mechanisms um, for mutual accountability. And that through that, then we, we can build more trust. And, um, you know, there's been a lot of studies about what local civil society, um, how they feel about international actors. And they don't feel trusted, they don't feel heard, you know, it's, and I think there's, that is one of the biggest shifts that we need to make um, in the field. So I'll stop there and let Rob add more. I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying listening, so you guys can keep going. Um, uh, so, I mean, I, so a couple of things that just uh, stood out um, for me, the, the part about r results, um, and we need to be results focused, I, and that's right, like we do need to be accountable to results, but we need to be accountable, I think, to results at multiple levels. Um, so there's, uh, I've reminded of an example of <coughs> an anti-slavery organization that one way that they uh, increased the numbers of people they helped free from slavery was actually to buy people out of slavery, um, which looks really great in that year, but what you've done, so that result like looks good, but the other result, the system's result looks really bad, right, because you just, increased the slavery value chain. Um, now you can exploit someone to their useful life is up and then you can sell them. Like, so, you've, you've, so you've actually almost increased the, the profitability of, of, of having slaves. And so thinking of results at these multiple levels, it's a both and, it's a, it's a both, we have to worry about and deal with the stuff that's in front of us and that we can, we can make uh, a difference on. And it's thinking about when we have an obligation to think about where, where do those results go in the medium and longer term. Um, and, but, and then underlying the point about partnership, because I think that's also really critical. And, and um, I think, Frank, you talked about, like, you need presence on the ground, right? You need, you need to build trust. And I think, again, if I were to look at one of the big differences I've seen within the group, it's been um, our program teams are, have gotten a lot bigger, as people are saying. We actually want to engage in a systemic way. We want to have put power in local hands, but we need to build these relationships and build this trust. And it just 
it, it really it really puts the uh, the dedication to partnership really to test because we have to put our money where our mouth is on that one. We have to really really um, resource that. Um, I think that, and then also the partnership goes the other way, which is that a lot of the ways that we we've been describing that works well or is work or could work better on the international from the international actor side. Um, oh, these are all things that run counter to the way the current peace building system is set up. So you're swimming upstream when you're trying to do this stuff. And oftentimes we need our allies on the ground to persuade, uh, fortunately I have a very easily persuadable board, but it's oftentimes a lot harder when you're in other bureaucracies where it's, it's a much more complicated uh, process of, of persuasion going the other way. And, and so there's also that level of partnership. It's not just a one way, we need you to be, help us do something. We, um, you know, it's not, we, we need you not just to do stuff in the country, we need you to help reform our own sector. Um, and, and so that's, a, that's another way to think about um, uh, partnership. And then I just wanted to add one other thing on uh, people-centric, I would say um, people-centric and systems aware. Like, so it's, it's both, right? It's, it's, you have to be, you deal with people, you have to be people-centric. And we have to step back occasionally and look at what's happening in the broader system. So with that, I thank you all for your initial th th thoughts and being so, um, yes, frank and honest and, and um, reflective. And I'll just mention, so one of the reasons we thought this panel would be a good idea is um, ISC has been asked to undertake a study. It's sort of reviewing the terms of aid to look at these questions of what should we be doing differently and what are the barriers. But I've certainly personally learned an, an immense amount from all of you. But I, again, I know there are a lot of experts in the room. So I'd now like to open it up to comments, questions. And um, um, yes, with that, I'll start at the back there. Well, th thank, thank you, everybody. I think everybody's feeling that's been a fascinating discussion. Um, I, I want to pose a question which has been an age-old one for me, which is the sort of uh, how do you uh, sort of face up to politics in these situations? Uh, how do you inject conflict sensitivity into the decisions about the partnerships between you know, the big donors and national governments and societies? Um, so, I mean, when the Paris principles uh, were there, I think the OECD commissioned a study about their uh, applicability in fragile states and came back with the answer that there are several ways in which Paris principles are not a great idea in fragile states because you need to be more sensitive to context. And that report was, I think, fairly quickly buried. But Accra instructed the international dialogue to go away and come back to Busan with a discussion on, okay, how do we do aid in, in fragile states? And they came up with the New Deal. But for civil society who were advocating on the New Deal negotiations, they were never satisfied with the model of uh, support one vision and one plan owned by the government over the horizon commitments because we've got to be more acceptance of risks. And I think those concerns have been borne out by some of the subsequent uh, history. Um, so. I mean, I think we have to think through uh, when you're looking at, uh, as you say, you're not just putting money in, but you're putting in money which you are trying to target towards addressing the grievances. But you have to ask the question, are you dealing with governments and particularly elites with the commitment to address grievances and trying to move the needle in the right direction or not? And what do you do to find that out? So I think some of the ideas about citizen participation in diagnosis of the grievances, civ civil society and citizen participation in the monitoring of whether the needle is moving in the right direction are all things that can make a difference. But I think thinking politically, if we think of the moment when people were trying to agree a New Deal compact for South Sudan, and they were trying to push through over the horizon commitments to the government, this was at a time when Salva Kiir was considering whether or not he needed to keep his political settlement with the uh, CPA uh, settlement or to sack his cabinet and uh, discard people and break with uh, Riyak Machar and whether Riyak Machar was going to go into the bush. So I think the sort of leaving out the politics from this decision making 
has been a repeated failure of this agenda. Um, and I'd yeah, just love to hear some thoughts on how do you build in conflict sensitivity without changing the mandate of the World Bank. Thank you. Why don't we take two more questions. Um, yes, please state your name and affiliation. I'm Stephen Gray with Adapt Peace Building, and I think my question and comment is in a pretty similar vein. Um, so it's a bit of a pushback on the idea of on the concept of fragility and the link to government and the need to extend government services as a means, a necessary means of peace building. And the point is really about context matters. So in many contexts, that's true. But in, in many contexts, it's not the conflict problem is about the right to govern. Who has the right to govern? And it's about exclusion. Uh, so the transition of development actors or the incorporation within development actors of peace building principles, I think we would all see as a positive movement, but with some concern that there is a much larger and more diverse set of actors that need to be brought into that, and particular with particular reference to liberation movements, non-state actors, that their whole reason for existence is premised on the idea that they don't have a say in the governing coalition. So if we support governments as a means of peace building in those contexts, we're picking winners in a contest where we should actually be facilitating a process in which they reach a new agreement. Um, so the question is about the willingness of development actors, and particularly the multilateral instit institutions, to diversify its partnerships and who it works with. Thank you. Uh, I'm Mariana Diaz. I'm from Colombia. I'm one of the Tomorrow's Peace Builders finalists <laughs> uh, from Mobilizatorios, my organization's name. And one thing that I wanted to point out, again, you mentioned it, is the thing about trust. For example, in Colombia, you can do a lot of things, and state has a lot of plans, but you don't know how to come into the regions to actually get institutions to get implemented there and that people actually use them usefully. You can put every like state institution in a, in a context, but if there's no trust and no real ownership of the society, it's quite useless. And this is a problem that we have in Colombia in many like rural regions particularly. So also pointing out what you said, how is it that development uh, aid comes to actually work with more civil society members? How is it choosing to do work with which organizations? How is, how is that method of choosing? <laughs> because in Colombia we have like the strategic 10 that everybody knows. <laughs> and then, but there's a lot of organizations and very useful organizations that do not get a cut of the, this pie because they just don't have the right connections, maybe. So I would really like to know if you have thought about new strategies to get to these like unknown actors that especially could be that hook to go into strategic regions where the state isn't really like the key player. All right, that's fine. Thank you, thank you. You need to speak too, so, <laughs> <laughs> so keep it, keep it. <laughs> thank you. Now, I think I mean the question is about how can you have a development actors which is sensitive to the conflict sensitivities aspect. I think this is key. I mean, maybe uh, I think your questions are the two questions are excellent. Uh, happy to let you know that before uh, I will speak louder because it's also very important. Before carrying out any strategic engagement in fragile country we are carrying out what we call a risk resilient assessment. It's actually now automatic. So in any fragile states, it was not the case before, but since IDA 18, for the past year and a half, we are carrying out what we used to call fragility assessment, now it's being called risk and resilient assessment. And that's precisely looking at what you may call politics, may not be politics, it's actually looking at the grievances that we all discussed. 
Is it about regional imbalance? Is it about the fact that services are not being provided to all the different groups of the society, ethnic groups? Is it about youth not being provided or women the right opportunities? Is it about also uh, not necessarily having the right citizen engagement? So it's completely context specific, it's country specific, and it's really aiming at looking at the drivers of fragility that we have discussed. Based on that, the engagement is precisely in a number of operations or then the financing will be trying to see through sectoral intervention, whether it's about transport, whether it's about uh, human capital, education, health, how can we contribute to address some of those key relevancies? And that's why you remember when I mentioned it's not about financing, it's about doing things differently and trying to tackle drivers of fragility. So responding directly to your two questions, yes, there is always uh, working progress, but I think the clear understanding about the drivers of fragility that would be completely different going from Yemen to Burundi to South Sudan or to CAR or to DRC, this is actually built in in our diagnostic before going into any strategic discussion or before going into financing. So I think it's quite important. So concrete example, uh, we just had, and I would encourage you to look at it in Niger, a country partnership framework that went to the board a few months ago that for the first time in terms of priorities, look at all the key drivers of fragility. And the number of operations that are benefiting from this country partnership strategy document are precisely aimed at addressing the whole issue about pastoralism, about management of natural resource, looking at um, uh, providing opportunities for farmers that have not necessarily received the same opportunity in the past in certain parts of the country. And there is amazing leadership from the government, by the way, talking about leadership, uh, Minister Kane, Minister of Planning, who is really taking agenda about prevention. And I think this is exactly a good example as well. I'm trying to also portray some good success story. But let's make it clear, you know, it's uh, ups and down. It's working progress. We're here for the long term. And we have to be very careful with short-term success because at the end we know uh, that it's a long-term engagement. But clearly this is not about financing. This is about doing things differently, precisely addressing what you call the conflict sensitivity aspects in our engagement and not providing just financing in a capital city. <laughs> That's yours, I don't know. <laughs> now, uh, let me come to the issue of sensit I mean, conflict sensitivity analysis. I, I think we may need to achieve, shift the lens with which we look at the, uh, the, the drivers of conflict. I personally believe that most of the conflict is not the, it's less about grievances or greed, it is more about this social contract. And I think this idea of social contract becoming a very important lens with which we can be able to look at things. One, to what level the peace agreement is actually addressing some of the core conflict issues. Second, whether the institutions are inclusive in, in the context of the diversity, in, in the, especially in the context of Africa. Third, the issue of social cohesion. And I think if you have these three parameters, you will be able to see, to navigate, identify specific core conflict issues. For example, issues of trust issues of representation. These are the things you may need to look at them through time so that you'll be able to see to what level the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the drivers of conflict are actually being addressed systematically. It is good that you mentioned the issue of uh, risk and, uh, and, and, uh, and resilience. I, I, so, so for me, I, I think this is one of the areas that we can look at things differently. And it's, especially me, I'm doing some work now on South Sudan. And I can see clearly the issue of state building and nation building, the state itself is still work in progress in Africa. The relationship between the state and citizen and the citizen among themselves, we assume this state they exist. Southern Sudan is a classical example that is assumed that the state is existing. And in fact, the state was crafted, but not actually subjecting itself to a real debate about the issue of social contract. So I think it's something that I want to, 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 to highlight. And I think, who is having the right to govern? We did some work with ODI, the issue of legitimacy, legitimacy and to what level the aid itself can be able to strengthen the legitimacy of the state. And actually at the local level, we found that it was found that these actors, the local actors, they tend to be a good bridge between the aid and the citizen, rather than the United States actors. And these are the things that have been shown clearly. And why I emphasize the local in institutions, it's becoming very important because sometimes we, we shy away that there are no capacity on the ground. The last one, this is spotlight, the, the light is spotlight, what do you say? 
in most cases in conflict. There is what we call anti-fragile anti state, anti-fragile institution. That institution that the flourish within the conflict. And these institutions and all actors, we keep an eye on those anti-fragile institutions in the context of the middle of war. And, and the champions, you, and this is the, the thing that we may need to keep in our, in, in our mind when we are looking at the conflict, especially the, the, the light spot, like what I call the anti-fragile institution. So this has been a very nice, pleasant, diplomatic conversation. And so I just want to shake it up a little bit because there is so much going wrong with aid. I mean, we all know this. All our institutions know it. Um, communities know it. We know it. And I actually um, was drawn to Peace Direct and really looking at how do you do it differently to support locally led peace building. Because I said, if the peace building uh, field ends up where the development field is writ large, we're lost because it is so ingrained in its own bureaucracies that are constraining the kinds of changes that we're trying to talk about and creating really unhealthy dependencies um, on all sides. So um, I think there's a huge do no harm conversation that needs to happen as well about, um, about development aid, but peace building aid too, um, and, and what we do with that. We've been doing research um, on aid um, sort of both the negative impacts of aid, but then also, well, what are positive examples and what are good practices? Um, and some of the things that you see happening are really um, dangerous for sustain issues of sustainability and the issues you're talking about, about who gets the aid, right? Who gets to be the select one? So one of the things we found is that part of what happens with local um, civil society groups is that international aid comes in, it's often channeled through large international uh, NGOs, and then they start creating these little mini-me's, right? And so the, the local groups start, oh, to get the money, I have to look like this and do this and follow these bureaucratic processes, and you actually lose the creative, locally-led um, potential of peace building. So um, in terms of things that I think need to change, it, it, there's a lot of it. And identifying who gets picked, who gets money, it is it is really problematic, and, and, we're, and nobody does it well. Um, but I think that that's because it's also about shifting power. And if we don't figure out how do we also shift power and control over resources so that local people who are most impacted by violent conflict have a say, have more of a say, and have a little more power at least, then we're just gonna stay stuck in our, in our um, bureaucracies. I don't know anybody in a large multilateral organization who doesn't agree with me when I say local people should be helping lead, they should be at the center, everyone agrees with it. The bureaucracies were really constraining. I worked in USAID for a couple of years. And it's really hard for everyone. There's a lot of good intentions, but we have to figure out how to do it a little bit better, I think, and shift that power. Just another plug for the systems view. Um, the, 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 I love the quote that says, systems uh, are exquisitely designed to do exactly what they do. And our, our aid system is designed, despite our best intentions, to do exactly what it's doing. And until we take accountability for that and acknowledge that, it's not going to change. Um, I kind of wanted to go to the, so I was, I was harking back to my, re, I, I was in Colombia just before, a week before the presidential election, and we were talking about the peace process yeah, with, with John Paul Lederach <laughs> and that group. Yeah, I figured you might have been there. Um, but the, um, and, and so what was, what was so glaringly apparent in a place like Colombia is that when, usually you get these sort of breakthrough, these big necessary political agreements, the, this, the locus of activities at the national level. And the problem with a lot of peace processes is that the locus of activity stays at the national level. And from a, from a complex systems perspective, when you, when you have these very murky dynamic challenges like peace in South Sudan or Rwanda or Colombia, you, the odds of one big plan, I think as you were saying, Larry, actually being right, and that then got all the support is, is zero. Like, so you actually want to push things down lower, you want to lower the stakes, you want to create more, you want to iterate more rapidly on sort of responsible, but sort of right size type experiments, and then learn from them. Um, and you have that requires that you can actually learn from them, because we tend not to want to do that either. Um, so, so I think that's one of the big challenges, is, is, is creating the infrastructure at the national level. You can't ignore the national level, because if you bypass it, right, you, you, you set the story that says that they're irrelevant, 
um, and, and, and they're not. They're necessary actors. And same at the sort of regional level or the, or the provincial level. But where the action is is at the local level. And that's where learning can happen, where you can be sensitive because sometimes it's, um, you need, uh, it, maybe it is the go a local government that's going to take the lead. Sometimes it might be the community organization. It might be a religious group. might be a political issue or an economic issue or a human rights issue or something that is locally going to be the catalyst for positive peace building to happen. Um, and, and so I think that's one of the big challenges. And, and again, it's, it's one of those things that the aid system doesn't like because we like control and, and accountability for money. And that's easier to do with a limited number of actors. And the more money you concentrate in fewer hands, the more power there is, the more conflict there is, and you're just, you're just setting yourself up to incite or invite the conflict to come back because you're just increasing the stakes, right? So um, I think that's one of the big structural problems we have. And so I, I, I don't want to be a total bummer. Um, <laughs> And this is where I, I, one thing I've learned about uh, the donor that I work for is that, you know, we're kind of medium-sized, um, but we have donors that are very risk tolerant. Um, I've heard this said in board meetings that if there's not a 70% chance this is going to fail, you're not taking enough risk. Um, so it, it, there's, a, there's a piece about how do we work together on the, the donor side, on the international uh, side, the, the intervener side, to get our act together. So maybe folks like the various media entities should be the ones that can take the risk at the, on the ground that USAID can't take, or, or maybe the World Bank can't take, right? Mm -hmm. But you also have resources that we don't have. I mean, you dwarf what, whatever we can spend. Um, so when you find stuff that starts to work, you can begin to actually institutionalize it and scale it up. But anyway, so I, I, I think there is hope that, that we can start to bridge some of these divides from our side of the table that will make it easier for the people on the ground to do what they need to do. Yeah, uh, well, what I wanted to just add is uh, when you look at the support that we pick from partners that come from outside as a recipient country, maybe we should look at two things. Uh, one is the, the intellectual property of it uh, in terms of what capacity that you bring on board that helps all these uh, ideas of uh, people-centric policy, uh, trust in, in, in the people themselves when they trust the leadership and where does this trust go beyond someone who has come in to help, uh, if I would use the term that is used by uh, aid supporters? And how are also these other stakeholders that are coming in with uh, the tools and the support going to benefit from these funds that the, also the recipient country is going to look at? So the level of coordination from the lowest of the low to the top, uh, if, if, if you look at it well, we, we, we always talk to ourselves, but where are all these people? Is the youth involved? Is the, are the women involved? Uh, what kind of uh, situations are we solving that go beyond uh, events like this one and, 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 the, and, the, and the different research that is out there? Thank you. Thank you. I think we have time for one more round of questions. Um, we go first here and then to you. Thank you. My name's Angie Yodermina. I'm from Nairobi, Kenya, from the Green String Network. Thank you <laughs> for what you've just said. It's broken. <laughs> and we all know it. <laughs> and we pussyfoot around it, and we talk about peace building and development and maybe governance. But, I mean, we use, actually, in Sierra Leone, where I've been working most recently, we use the, the cup as the analysis of, of the community is the cup, and it's cracked. And we keep pouring in the water. And we do it with the communities, and the communities are like, uh, yeah, <laughs> what can we do with that water when the cup is cracked? We can't. <laughs> There's nothing to be done. It can't be utilized. And the communities and the institutions, the systems thinking you're talking about, have to be a part of creating the repair of the cup. And the repair of the cup has to be owned. And I've done work in South Sudan um, with a U.S. government program where I was told South Sudanese had no capacity to lead their healing agenda. And I said, how can you be here? You should be kicked out. <laughs> because, of course, South Sudanese have the ability to lead their healing agenda. If they're not repairing their cup, who can? Really, who can? So thank you. Something's broken. 
and it's the cup that's the community and the institution. And if people start to heal their crack, starts to fix that crack, we'll be able to drink from it. <laughs> we'll be able to use it to water things. Anyway, thank you. We're thinking about it. But let's be really honest, it's broken. Hussein Ibrahim, I'm from Peace Research and Education Program at NYU, and thank you very much, Bridget. And my point is about the accountability. Recently, uh, Susanna Campbell from American University just published Global Governance, in which she kind of like studied dozens of cases, and she found the more the international NGOs are accountable toward the locals, the more their program have been successful. With that being said, with the World Bank, the UN, the thing is they're trying to have the international governments and the state to hold accountable. Why wouldn't they try to make the communities, the locals, strong enough to hold their government accountable? In my experience, the more you hold, like the international actors, when they hold the governments accountable, it's good. It works in most of the cases. But what it leads those governments to do, they go behind the table and they just do horrible stuff and hide it and deny it. And you, you see reports coming out in those, all of the fragile states. The second thing that I am, like, I can't hear about it is, and I've been into a lot of events, is about uh, the corruption. There is no mechanism to fight the corruption. Like, if you work any and all of the states that are failing or that are fragile, the corruption is one of the main causes of the fragility. And, and the last point here is, that's why I thanked you. Like Bridget's program, I really love the way the Peace, work, the peace Direct works. Most of the international NGOs, they have to have the proposal and the program designed to apply for the fund then they receive the fund, then they go to the community. It's less than before, but still, those programs have been designed outside of the context that it will serve. Like, those beneficiaries have nothing to say in the design. And that's why I really appreciate what you do. You partner with them. The, the better methodology is to have equitable partnership. It's true. I, as a Kurdish person in northern Iraq, I may not have the experience that these international NGOs have, but what I will appreciate them doing for me, not come to me, Hussein, do this, come to me, Hussein, let's work towards solving this thing. And that's my last comment. Thank you very much. Okay. One last quick question. Hi, uh, my name is Alexis Liras. I'm uh, from university from Japan. I'm not Japanese, obviously. But, um, but I've been in the US 15 years, so I'm doing peace building and working with academia. I've been, thank you so much for all the inspiring talks. And I was going through uh, your CVs and you all have a very impressive background and very impressive education. We went to good universities. So uh, if we consider that to conceptualize all this, uh, all the, the complexity of the systems and uh, the accountability, design and delivery and needs assessment. So how do you see the role of academia in the local context as a contributor of building the capacity of, of these systems, and th that's the first part and the second part. If you see a crucial role in that, what kind of resources do you invest to build the capacity of academic agencies in this reform, in this vision? Thank you. Thank you. So we now have about two minutes each to respond to the question and, make your, and have your last word. Okay, I have the microphone, so I'll go first, um, and thank you all um, for the kind words and the work that you do. Um, I'll just start with academia because I'm supposed to speak later um, to an academic group. And um, I titled the talk, The Profession of Peace Building, What They Won't Teach You in School. Because actually, I think I've, what I've learned is from local people working for peace. That's who's educated me. I don't, the, the school, the system, it's important. We have a lot of knowledge that we need to collect in it through an academic system and transfer and learn together. But, um, but I, I also have issues with the academic 
field of peace building. Locally, though, I think it, it's remarkable how many people now all around the world have gone through peace and conflict studies programs of one type or another. I mean, it's incredible. There is a network from you know, universities all over the world. So there's, that's a huge capacity, a local capacity definitely to build on. Um, and then uh, just on the issue of um, government accountability and corruption, I mean, we work with partners who will say the problem for me and my community is the government. What do I do? And they're actually really interested in learning about advocacy, um, learning skills and training for how do they engage constructively and safely. So some of them, and some of them say right now, no, nope, that's not going to work. So, but that's something else that, like, in terms of building capacities, they don't just want money and more program. They want to figure out how do I hold my government accountable? You know, what what can we do together to to address those problems? And finally, I'll just say. Um, uh, give an example that I think gives me hope about change. So we wanted to do work um, in Mali, and we wanted to do it in the kind of approach you described. Let the local peace builders design what's needed and then support them to do it. And so we, we did a mapping. We started and said, okay, well, who's out there in, map, in, in, in Mali and what can we learn about them? And we found over 200 local peace building groups that were quite viable good groups. And then we took that mapping, we got, we got a little funding from a flexible private funder to do the mapping. And then we took the mapping to the government of Canada. And we said, we're, we're not going to tell you what we're going to do, who's going to do it, exactly who's going to do it, or what the outcomes are going to be. But look at these 200 remarkable local groups that we're going to engage, create spaces, they're going to design, they're going to find strategies for cooperation. And then you can seed that funding and support it. And they went for it. So, so there, there are donors who are trying to make these shifts, and I think that is a point um, of hope for me. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'll speak to the part of the academia, uh, how it could be relevant to us. Uh, while we're developing our vision uh, 2020, we're focused on uh, what we define as the homegrown solutions that are easily adoptable by the communities around. So based on what we have, uh, the academia would come in with different cases uh, and the best practices that have been done uh, that could be attached to what we're doing. So, so to say, uh, that enabled uh, Rwanda today as an example that others can learn from. Thank you. Just I would like to rebound one point, which is about the importance of scaling up local initiative. I don't think we do it enough, and I do think there is a real potential. Because at least what it brings not necessarily the top global knowledge that you, that you have uh, in each country, but actually brings the whole uh, dynamics and ensuring that the activities aimed at being um, uh, addressing some grievances at the local level. And I think there is a huge potential in that. Uh, should we do more? Yes, uh, but I, I do think it represents. So I think I would say more the ball into our colleagues, my left, to say do not hesitate as well not necessarily to see the empty half of the cup, but actually trying to see we believe in this specific context, in the center of Mali, it makes sense, and why. So having a positive voice, the world is changing. We're in 2018, and as you may see, we're more and more recognizing the importance of true partnership on the ground, and each country will be different. So I think it's important to have this constructive spirit of bringing those initiatives, because honestly, I do think it can make a difference. Mm -hmm. Looking at the whole point about elite capture and making sure of not doing harm, but actually strengthening the citizen engagement, social accountability. Of course we look at it. When I was looking at the conflict sensitivity grievances, do you think that we're not looking at those points? And the whole point about strengthening institution in some case that actually could be more harmful than anything else. So I think that's part of this assessment. And I would like to say that in some case, the whole point of elite capture leads to have a very strong program about social accountability, feedback using uh, technology. We're in 2018, cell phone, it can be very cheap compared to third party monitoring, making sure that all the user beneficiaries, they can report through grievance redressal mechanism. So please realize as well that things are changing. Uh, and I think it's important to look at it, not necessarily the classical way 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago of providing financing because states are fragile, but also recognizing that we do things differently. Can we do more and better? Big time. But I think it's always important, I'm looking at some of the countries that took fantastic leadership in addressing issues and trying to see how can we replicate. Because otherwise, you know, the situation can be very bleak at some times. And the very last point is about um, yeah, academics, university. I do think academics, university has actually a good role to play. 
I also do believe experience on the ground, I have been on the ground, working with private sectors is super important. But the whole point about raising awareness about the importance of prevention, for instance, I do think that academics university uh, needs to play a role so that we are not looking about responding crisis, pouring money, but more looking in advance. So there are a number of topics where I do believe university academics can play actually a very important role, especially local, national ones, uh, I mean. Yeah, I will, I will talk about your point because I, I, I have a very interesting experience in, at the National University. But I think the point you raise is about the production of knowledge and whose nar narrative. And I think it is very clear that the, uh, the aid itself is actually providing a mechanism not to support the national production of knowledge, but for the developed countries to come and produce knowledge and create a narrative for the South. And, 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 and I think one of the things, for example, when I was at the university in Juba, it was a very clear case that the local researchers are used just as key informant, but not really to be able to, and you get a young researcher coming from the developed countries to come and do research, and then this is where aid has never been quite successful. In, in, in strengthening the, uh, the homegrown uh, knowledge production. I think this is an area, and I have been talking, for example, USID, you have, we have this university, we have good, good people, but no, it, all the resources are being channeled, the research. But definitely the utility of research also is a question, because it's, and I, I think this is a concern, to what level the research will be able to make a difference. And, uh, and especially in the developed countries, especially in Africa, you need to navigate even with the knowledge. I become a victim because of the way I tried to handle the, the, the knowledge in such a way to become life-threatening. Some of our leaders are becoming more comfortable with external researchers coming to talk on that rather than a local researcher to talk about issues. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's a, it's, a, it's a problem, so we have our own, our own problem there. But let me conclude one thing that I want to conclude with. Aid is a good thing. Aid is not a bad thing. It is just like oil. It is the way we manage it that makes the difference. Great stuff. Great. Um, so I'll, I'll try to hit the three real quick. Um, start with um, the point about accountability. Like, um, so I won't go into the depth on this, but we one of the mapping efforts we did was around humanitarian response in violence affected areas. And two of the big patterns that we identified, we quite eloquently eloquently labeled accountability fail one and accountability fail two. So, but they're, they're core, core dynamics about how our own accountability systems, which are meant to ensure effectiveness, actually are undermining our impacts. Um, we can talk more about what those entail, but um, on the academic side, I think what's, I mean, really interesting, depending on the, on the particular context, but in a lot of ways, in, in certain situations, not in all by any means, but in some situations, um, the academic uh, institutions can be a bit of an honest broker. In, in situations that are contested, um, depending on the, the situation and the role of the, of the institution. But um, there, are, there are ways that they can do networking, they can bring people together in kind of a neutral space. So there's, they can play some really important roles, I think, uh, at times. The other, the other piece that I think, other big contribution from an academic ins institution is that, you know, people, um, we, we criticize people for making, not making evidence-based decisions, which is true, and, and we should criticize that. And, uh, uh, Bringing together good evidence to bear on complex problems has a huge transaction cost to it. And universities are in a much better position to sort of ease that transaction cost, because that's their, they have people who do that, right? Who have that knowledge and have the research methods and so on, who can actually do that. So I think it's another huge contribution because we have to learn our way into, into improving these practices and, and finding effectiveness. And then I think on the, um, the local capacity question, right? If there's no local capacity, right? Well, you're screwed, right? Because, but so, we, one thing we, is a mantra within our organizations is systems change best when systems change themselves. And, and so we have to find the way that maybe our role is helping to activate something that's already there. Um, and when we do a lot of the mapping work, we, uh, people tend to want to identify the patterns, the dynamics that are causing the problems. And, we, and so they'll have only these negative patterns that they've identified. And we'd say, well, look, if a system only had negative patterns in it, it would, it would melt down and, and you know, implode to the center of the earth. It have, there have to be stabilizing and even virtuous patterns that are happening here. And if you can't, if you don't know them, you gotta go back and find them because they're there. 
And, and so they, taking that on a, as an article of faith, that those things have to be there. Because if they're not, no situation would, would last a day. So they are there, and we just have to, we have to work harder at finding them. So I think all that's left for me to say is a huge thank you to all of you, to the panelists, and um, all of you for engaging in such a thoughtful discussion. Um, I think if the international dialogue were here, I think that from what you've all said, you've got the um, agenda for the next New Deal, um, the 2.0, which has the citizen voice and the community right at the heart as the central purpose, um, but really does take seriously these themes that we've heard about integration where appropriate, um, about partnerships, the right partnerships with the right actors at the right level, from the citizen and the community right through to the global uh, actors and institutions, um, and that is system aware. And I think I'll just leave you all with a question. Um, you know, how might each of you and all of us continue this kind of conversation, um, which is honest about what isn't working, but looks forward to trying to mend some of these bonds and build the right networks um, to, to, to work towards our, our collective goals. But thank you very much. I will have to. Yeah, yeah, yeah.